Whenever Skyward Sword is being discussed, the Laneru Desert is one area of the game that is brought up quite frequently. It's definitely a fan favorite location, including mine. It has some stellar music, interesting and mysterious ruins, some of the best dungeons in the Laneru mining facility and the sand ship, and of course one of the best gameplay mechanics in any Zelda game to date, the Time Shift Stones. The scorching sands of Laneru hold all sorts of tales, from a race of sentient machines, their futuristic and highly sophisticated infrastructure, a hidden and powerful technology, and the tragedy of severe climate change. And today I want to take a closer look at this fascinating location, discuss some of the ruins, the purpose they once served, what made it all fall into decay over the many centuries, and other little tidbits of information about this area. Suffice it to say, spoilers are inbound. If you haven't finished the game yet, or at the very least haven't played through all the sections of this province, I advise coming back later. These parts of the game are definitely worth going in blind. It really is that good. With that said, let's get into it. Let's start by getting the lay of the land. Some of the first things we learn about Laneru is that it wasn't always a desert, but instead a vast and green landscape, and that it was once home to a mining operation. And not just any mining operation, but an absolutely massive one. Upon entering Laneru for the first time from the south, the mines are one of the first places we encounter, a network of caves, tunnels and quarries connected by minecarts. It is also here that we learn that the time shift stones, which we'll get into later, are the primary resource being mined and transported here. Beyond this point, we enter what I would consider the central square of this operation. In the present it looks like just a bunch of disconnected pieces of wall sticking out from the sand, but one quick glance at the map shows that they used to be connected, sort of like a web of elevated walkways. At the center of all this we find the entrance to the Laneru mining facility, a sort of pyramid-like structure with a stairway leading up to it. This entrance is initially buried and doesn't show up until Link activates three power nodes which all correspond with the elements of the three dragon deities water, fire and electricity. Two of these power nodes are found inside two buildings, which, according to the game, once served as power generators or power plants. Once all power nodes are activated, the mining facility rises from the earth. Huh. That looks uh, kind of familiar. Anyway, we also find the Temple of Time to the west of the central square, of which its entrance is initially blocked by Impa but is later cleared away by Girahim during his attack on Zelda. Luckily for Link there is a secondary entrance leading into the Temple of Time, which requires traversing the Laneru mining facility whose back entrance leads directly into the temple. We'll get into more detail about these structures later when we cover the overall infrastructure, its purpose and how it's all connected. To the southeast of the central square there is a cave leading into three different directions. One of them loops back to the mines, the other to Laneru Gorge, home of the Thunder Dragon, and the third one leads to the ancient harbor. Aside from being the home of the Thunder Dragon, the gorge isn't all that interesting to talk about. There is one additional cave system here, but judging from the minecarts and the ore chutes, this was simply yet another excavation site and nothing more. As for the Dragon Spirit, his role has been revealed to be protecting and watching over the province, as is often the case with deities in the Zelda series. The ancient harbor is where things get a lot more interesting. It borders what's known in the present as the Sand Sea, a huge stretch of desert land which houses three prominent structures, Skipper's Retreat, the Shipyard and the Pirate Stronghold. Additionally, a large vessel known as the Sand Ship sails around in this area as well. With all that said, it's obvious that every one of these structures, the mines, the mining facility, power generators, Temple of Time, Ancient Harbor and Sand Sea are all intrinsically connected. They all played a part in whatever operation was going on here. Which brings us to the ancient robots in charge of said operation. Although they are clearly built by someone to serve a specific purpose, Purpose, their AI, in terms of complexity, seems to be on par with the consciousness of non-synthetic life forms. They display feelings of fear, grief, anger, love, excitement and other emotions commonly seen in biological creatures. Despite this, they do seem to be programmed to serve various purposes which all contribute to a single end goal. Most of them don't have unique names and are simply called by their model number. 
LD-301, which according to Fai are just one of a number of mass-produced robots. There are some exceptions though, as we meet two similar ancient robots who do have a name, that being Skipper and Scrapper. They do still have the same model number as all the others, but with an additional letter, probably to signify their special role, followed by the name. The regular 301 models seem to be part of the general workforce, those who perform the mining, manage the infrastructure and so on, while Skipper and Scrapper are more unique models who serve different purposes. Skipper being a captain who commands the sandship and its crew, and Scrapper likely being a salvager or transport robot, seeing as he is able to fly and is outfitted and programmed to carry and transport heavy objects. There might have been more of the same type of model as Skipper and Scrapper, but as far as we know they are the only survivors of their kind. I like to think that the L in LD simply stands for Leneru, as a way to indicate the location where these robots would be deployed. At first I thought LD simply stands for Leneru Desert, but then I realized that when these robots were made, Leneru probably wasn't a desert yet, so that would make no sense. So whatever, a Leneru droid? Digger? I am definitely overthinking this. Besides, in some languages the prefix is totally different. 301 seems to be the number assigned to the generation it belongs to, which could mean that there were other models preceding the 301 generation, ones which were discontinued, perhaps because of errors or glitches in their system, or because the technology simply advanced further and further over time. And there is actually some proof for this, as there is another ancient robot with a different model number than the rest, that being the Pirate Captain, also known as LD-0. 002G Skurvo. Just like all the others, it has the LD prefix, but its model number is 002 instead of 301, meaning that he's from a much older generation, likely the second generation. This explains why he looks so vastly different from the other ancient robots, being more tall and humanoid and still walking on two legs instead of hovering like the others do. Hello, this is Don from the future. So while I was capturing footage for this episode, which I didn't do until long after I already recorded the voiceover, I suddenly noticed that the ancient robots are not hovering. In fact, they are riding. I don't know why I thought they were hovering. Maybe because they move so smoothly across the surface I thought they were hovering like a few centimeters off the ground or something. But no, they totally have wheels. I have no idea how I missed this the first time playing, but you know, I thought I'd just mention it. Anyway, back to the video. It also explains its hostility. It is implied that he once served on the skipper until turning on his fellow automata and resorting to mutiny. It then set up its own base, that being the pirate stronghold, and henceforth started to terrorize the seas and messing with the transport vessels. It's also implied that he wasn't alone in doing this and that there was a whole band of pirates. So maybe the entire 002 generation was enacting this behavior. I guess even robots can long for a pirate's life. As such, this could be the reason why this particular model was discontinued, as it is clearly prone to insubordination. Which leads into the next question. Who was responsible for building these ancient robots? Well, it's never outright explained in the game, but the main consensus has always linked them to the Sheikah. The only real concrete evidence we had for this at the time of Skyward Sword's original release was the Sheikah eye symbol present on some of the time shift stones, as well as the fact that the gates of time, which are clearly hinted to have been built by the Sheikah, are made from time shift stones, the main resource being mined at Leneru Desert. But that was back in 2011. Nowadays, with the addition of Breath of the Wild and Age of Calamity, the evidence for the Sheikah being responsible responsible for the construction of the ancient machines and their interest in time shift stones has become much more convincing. Prior to Skyward Sword, the Sheikah were mostly portrayed as a shadowy ninja tribe who served the royal family of Hyrule. Sure, there were some small hints at their connection to time, such as the gossip stones, but it was all very much open to interpretation. Breath of the Wild was the first to truly showcase undeniable proof of the tribe's affinity and skill to build sophisticated high-tech machinery, and Age of Calamity demonstrated its connection to actual time travel. We learn from one of the 301 models inside the mines that all ancient machinery which they themselves are part of are all powered by time shift stones. It is also what incentivizes them to keep the operation running as without new time shift stones they will inevitably shut down. This proves that the time shift stones, although incredibly powerful as an energy source, are finite and will run out of juice eventually. And it's possible that the ancient blue energy seen in Breath of the Wild is directly linked to time shift stones, in liquid form this time around. But 
that's a whole nother story. However, it's also clear that powering the technology that drives the mining operation is not the end goal. After all, why mine something just to fuel the very system to mine more, like a perpetual cycle? Instead, it seems there was a much more significant intention behind all of this. One of which, of course, being the construction of the Gates of Time. But the question is, why? We know that they were ultimately used by Link and his friends to travel between the past and the present in order to defeat Demise. But these mining operations clearly took place long, long before the time period Link and Zelda live in. We are never given a definitive number in terms of how much time spans between the past, when these mining operations took place, and the present, i.e. the time period Link and Zelda grew up in, but it is made clear that it's at least a few thousand years. The main purpose for the construction of the Gates of Time was to find Zelda in the future so she could become the vessel for Goddess Hylia, as well as being used by Link in his fight against Demise. So how did the Sheikah know to build two gates to travel through time for something that wouldn't transpire until thousands of years into the future? And the obvious answer is, this wasn't their idea. Instead, they were simply doing what Goddess Hylia instructed them to do. It's clear that the Goddess perceives time very differently than regular mortals, including the Sheikah. From her memory, Phi sometimes communicates messages directly from the Goddess to Link, in in which she says that she will guide him from her place at the quote-unquote edge of time. The fact that she can construct such an elaborate plan which is executed over the course of thousands of years, creating Phi and the Goddess Sword, preparing Zelda to be her vessel, and leaving messages for a hero who won't be born until thousands of years later, shows that her nature as a divine being allows her to see time in a very different construct knowing what needs to be done long before it happens. She knew that Demise would break free someday, and probably even knew when. As such, she ordered the Sheikah to start a massive mining operation to gather the time shift stones needed to construct the Gates of Time. Which brings us back to the Laneru Desert. It is shown to us that the construction of a time gate requires huge amounts of crystals, and two needed to be built, so you can imagine the quantity. These crystals also seem to be much more pure and refined than the raw stones we find inside the quarries. As such, a huge workforce was needed to meet this quota, numbers which the Sheikah at the time likely didn't have. And being the friendly neighborhood ninjas that they are, instead of resorting to classic slavery, they instead built machines to get the job done. With all that in mind, it's quite easy to piece together how the project operated, which is where we need to take a leap into the province's ancient past. It is unfortunately never explained what the origins of the Time Shift Stones is, or how they came to be so abundant in this province in particular, but it might have a connection to the Goddess of Wisdom, Nehru, which the province is named after. She is said to be the source of the fundamental laws that govern the world, which probably includes time as well. We can see this trend return in Oracle of Ages, where we meet a character by the same name, Nehru, who's connected to time. But that's all just speculation and we may never know, so let's focus on the mining project itself. From the looks of it, the raw material was dug up inside the many caves, particularly the mines to the south. From there, they would be transported to the mining facility by a series of minecarts, and likely also by 301S series like Scrapper, who were capable of carrying heavy loads from location to location. One of the ancient robots close to the entrance to the mining facility states that it's here that the time shift stones were produced. So the facility was nothing more than just a huge factory in which the raw time shift crystals were processed and refined. The power plants near by, as you may have guessed, supplied power to the factory. And it seems that in the case of an emergency, like an attack from outside forces, the power to the facility could be severed, after which it would sink into the ground. Inside the facility we see a further desire to protect and secure the operation from possible intruders, as Phi states that the Bemo's enemies are in fact not monsters with malicious intent, but simply a part of the ancient security system that would have protected the facility. Obviously, since Link is an unregistered entity from a different time time period no less, it recognizes him as an intruder and attacks him. At the end of the line of the facility, the now refined time shift crystals would have been transported to two different locations, right through the back door and into the Temple of Time where the first gate would be constructed, which explains why there's a back door in the first place, and the rest would be transported to the ancient harbor. This also showcases the detailed environmental storytelling in this province. In the boss room, which is the second to last room of the facility, we can see multiple railway tunnels leading underground. 
ground, accompanied by these mechanical trains which would have been able to transport multiple wagons filled with timeshift stones. At the ancient harbor we see something similar, multiple railway tunnels all coming together at one central point, likely the end of the very same tunnels we saw inside the mining facility. So the harbor is where the remaining crystals from the facility accumulated, and from here they would be loaded onto ships and transported across the sand sea to their final destination. Those who've played the game know that the sand sea wasn't always, well, a sea of sand, and probably didn't even go by that name. Because in the past it was a real sea, a vast body of water stretching across the west of the province and into unknown territory. Skipper's Retreat and the Shipyard speak for themselves, places where the crews of the ships lived and where the ships were being built and repaired. And of course the Pirate Fortress which, as mentioned before, was likely built by the older models who went rogue at some point. But what happened after this? Where did the remaining timeshift stones go? Well, as mentioned before, a second gate of time was being constructed in the Farron province inside the Temple of Hylia. And if I had to guess, this is exactly where the other crystals were being transported to. Large sections of Skyward Sword's map are left blank, and we aren't allowed to see what lies there. But if we are to assume that the sea stretches all the way across the bottom of the map, just like it does in Breath of the Wild, then it suddenly becomes clear why the timeshift stones were being loaded onto ships to the west instead of directly being transported east towards the Farron province. Transporting big loads across the sea requires a lot less infrastructure, and is a lot faster than having to haul small loads across land one at a time, or having to build roads, railways and tunnels all the way from one province to the next. All you need is a couple of ships, two docks and you're good to go. The ships could carry huge amounts to Farron, unload them at the dock, after which they would only be a stone throws away from their final destination. <laughs> Puns. And in fact, we do see that Farron is closely connected to water. There's a huge lake at the bottom, which could be saltwater based, and rivers running in and out of the province. So yes, I believe the purpose of the shipping routes was likely to transport timeshift stones to Farron, after which they would be used to construct the second gate of time. Maybe some leftover time crystals were exported to other locations, perhaps traded or sold to other provinces or maybe even other continents, but I don't believe that would have been the main goal. Now before we move on to the final segment where we cover the decline of Lanayru, there's one more idea I want to discuss, and I'm curious what you guys think. Now that I've actually played the game myself, there's one section in the game which immediately left me with a lot of questions, which is this part right before the second fight with Girahim. Up until this point in the story, the existence of the second gate of time was unknown, not only to Girahim but Link as well. It is here that they first find out because of an ancient decoration on a wall, but this wall is inside the fire sanctuary all the way up in the Elden province. What is this ancient drawing doing here? I never got the impression that the ancient Shika were active in Elden. There's no time shift stones or ancient machinery to be found here, nor does the Shika eye symbol make an appearance. This section of Elden volcano is also extremely inhospitable. It is apparent that there was an ancient civilization living here, but if anything I would have expected this to be a race like the Gorons or maybe the Magma. You know, creatures who are known to be able to resist extreme temperatures. And if this is true, then why would the ancient Shika share this secret information about the two gates of time with some unknown group of people living in Elden? You would think that the less people know about this stuff, the bigger the chance of, you know, keeping it a secret. Then I realized that most of the materials used to construct the robots, the railways, the other machinery consists of some sort of metal, right? But as far as we know, there's no metal present in Laneru or Farron for that matter. But you know who does have metal? The Elden province. More specifically, Elden Ore. According to the lore found inside the Fire Sanctuary, the Elden Province was once ruled by an unknown king. Is it a coincidence then that inside the Fire Sanctuary, which looks like an ancient palace, we find this depiction of the two gates of time, the only depictions of them in Hyrule? This means that whoever the king and the people who lived here were, they were likely the only ones who knew about the gates of time aside from the Sheikah. Maybe in exchange for Elden Ore, the Sheikah let them in on the secret, or promised other things in return turn, or the king was just a good Samaritan who wanted to help with Hylia's plan. Either way, there was definitely a deeper connection between the Sheikah and this ancient kingdom, which, I don't know, I just found very interesting. Maybe I'll do a more detailed video about this ancient kingdom since there are a lot of mysteries to uncover, but for now I'll just leave it as it is. 
And with that we arrive at the final subject, the decline, or should I say desertification, of Lanayru. It's not exactly a mystery as to why Lanayru fell into decay and slowly turned into a desert. I mean, it's flat out told to us in the game. And for a change it didn't have anything to do with evildoers, curses or wars, but simply a case of severe climate change as a result of too much industry. The land was literally being depleted. And it seems that the robots themselves were not oblivious to the change in their environment since inside one of the power stations we find a notice which mentions the decline of the area, stating that plants are dying and even a call to action to keep Lanayru green. It's not exactly clear if it was the machines who set into motion the slow decay of plant life in the region. Some speculate that the time shift stones themselves may have had sort of a radioactive element to them. After all, one of the robots states that the crystals are, quote, dangerous to humans, but it never explains why or what that means. Whatever the case may be, it's obvious that the the mining project had something to do with the rapid change in Lanayru's landscape, and also that there was very little that could be done to stop it once the problem was noticed. Planting new trees clearly didn't help. The soil had lost its fertility and slowly but surely the issues of climate change became bigger and bigger. As more and more plants and trees died, the province became increasingly dry. Sand started clogging up the machines and facilities, slowly grinding the mechanisms to mine and refine timeshift stones to a halt. Without new supplies of timeshift stones, the machines started shutting down, as there was no longer any power to support them. Until finally, the entire synthetic workforce of Lanayru succumbed to the loss of energy. By the time Link visits the province, the mining operations have laid dormant for a very long time. How long exactly is unknown, but it has to be at least a thousand years. This is given away by the presence of the Araka, scorpion-like creatures who've made a home for themselves inside the province. They aren't found in the past, indicating that they only started migrating to Lanayru due to the change in climate. According to Fai, if they live long enough to survive their very lengthy larval state, they grow up to be a Moldorak, a gigantic scorpion which bears the nickname Thousand Year Arachnid. We can find two of these in the game, one inside the mining facility and the other inside the shipyard's construction bay. The very existence of these thousand year arachnids shows that these factories have been abandoned for at least a thousand years, and likely longer than that. Since then, Lanayru has sort of become like a ghost town, with its only inhabitants being the various creatures who managed to survive the harsh climate and the occasional treasure hunter or adventurer brave enough to explore the area. It's a great example of a land that once was, the remains of its glory days slowly but surely being wiped from history by nature, buried beneath a layer of dust and sand. It's a bit of a sad sight to behold. Although the ancient robots were mere machines, so to speak, they show clear signs of having led normal lives. Things like friendship, family and companionship. But alas, now they lay to waste in the scorching sun, unable to speak. I guess even the life of a robot has to come to an end sometime. Although we don't know much about what happened after the events of Skyward Sword, it's highly likely that Lanayru was the precursor to the Gerudo Desert, home of the Gerudo and the future king of evil, Ganondorf. Inside the province, a small flying creature can be found which carries the name the Gerudo Dragonfly, which is long before the Gerudo even saw their inception. And it might just be that this little creature is what ultimately served as the inspiration for the name of the future tribe that would come to live here. 